This is the uh, video tutorial for lesson 11.1. .1. This is the uh, first of two, actually. This is going to be focused on a domain and range and also the difference between a relation and a function. So what we've started off here is we've talked about our inputs and outputs, which you'll have seen in middle school before, where really what the correct words are domain and range. We put some numbers into a rule. We get some other numbers out. Starting number is your domain. Finishing number is your range. So what's the difference between the two? Well, a relation is a set of ordered pairs, or you could say coordinates. And a function is also a set of ordered pairs, but importantly, the x values do not repeat. And the main thing we've got to be able to do is switch between the different ways of representing the data. So we could have ordered pairs, tables, mappings, and graphs. And you can see all of these on this little picture here. And actually, all of these things represent the same data here. So coordinates 1, 2, 3, 5, negative 2, 4. And you can see the same thing in a table here. I just switch the order and I put that coordinate first and then so on. Uh, for a mapping, on the left-hand side, we have all our numbers in order, smallest to biggest. And on the right-hand side, we have the same thing. And the arrows point to basically the coordinates. So negative two, four, one, two, and three, five. And the graph, that would just be your basic plot. So one, two is one along the x-axis and then two up the y-axis, three, five, three along the x-axis, five up the y-axis, and negative two, four would be negative two on the x and four. So basically given one of these, we should be able to convert to the other ones just by understanding how these things actually work. So when we're looking at domain, uh, this is the x values as we said. So if we're given a list of coordinates, literally you're just looking at the first values. And as you're doing them, you're putting them in smallest to biggest, and you're not repeating any values that you see. So the smallest number I see is negative three, then zero. There are two twos, but you only mentioned a two once, so you don't have to repeat the value. For range, you're looking at the y values, so the ones that you can see highlighted here. And same thing, smallest to biggest, but no repeats. So negative two, four, five, and seven. And then obviously you can practice doing the same thing here. So pay attention to the words. The domain is just the X values and you just put them in order, no repeats, and arrange is the Y values, same thing. Put them in order, smallest to biggest, and make sure there's no repeats. Um, if they're in a table, this is actually even easier to do. You can literally just read down. You can see all the X values lined up here. You don't even have to remember the first coordinate is the X value. So one, two, three, four. And for the range, the y values, three, four, five, six. Um, notice the, uh, the set notation we use for this, the sort of curly brackets, I think they're called. Um, we call them something different in England, so I sometimes get the American and the British term mixed up. Um, the other one is the mappings. So same thing, smallest to biggest, smallest to biggest. And then from here, you can just read off which values are. So anything that has an arrow coming from it, that would be part of our inputs or our domain. So negative three, four, seven, and eight. And our range, even though there's two numbers that go to the two, we only count it one time, so two, six, and 25. So equally very easy to be able to do for that as well. And then there's a question that you can practice on here just to make sure that you understand what the term domain means, and also some of those little subtleties that we just talked about. When they give you a uh, graph like this, then one of the ways we can do this is we can fill in the table. And then from the table, we saw how easy that is to do. So if we focus on one point at a time, negative one, negative two, negative three, and then two up, uh, we can just go ahead and we can fill in our table here. So I'm doing this in a very organized manner so I don't forget. So I'm starting at the left and working to the right. So this point here would be negative two. And as I go down one, this would be negative one. Uh, negative one, and then down three. So that will be negative one and negative three. Uh, we have zero, zero. Uh, this would be one, one. And this point here would be three, zero. So as I'm putting them in order using my set notation, uh, looking for the smallest numbers. So it looks like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, three. And there is no repeats on this. So that makes that very easy to do. Negative one. Zero, one, and three. And for the range, uh, let's have a look what we have here. These are not quite so easy to do. So negative three looks like the smallest one. And negative one. I can see two zeros, so I'm only going to put one of those. 
uh, a one and a two. I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss any of those. Now, that's the way that they would like you to do it by doing a table. Um, I personally find it easier if I'm doing domain, knowing that it refers to the X values, which is this axis here. I would just start on the left and I would actually just read either down to the axis or up to the axis and literally just read off each of these numbers. If it lies on the axis, then you just read what that number is. So personally, if I was doing domain, I wouldn't actually fill out the whole table. I would just read this here. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and three. So you would still end up with the same answers without the need for actually having to fill out a table. And if I was doing the uh, range, I would actually do the same thing, but this time I'll go to the Y values. So I would read across, so I would go to here. And basically I'm just looking up just to make sure I don't miss any points. If there's two together on the same one like this here, that's just fine. We'll just count it one time. And this point here. So this is negative three, this is negative one, that's zero, one and two. So just a different way of thinking about it. Um, so depend on how you prefer to do it. If you're happy writing down the coordinates, you can certainly do that. Or you can just read across to the axis depending on which one it asks for. Specifically, if it only asks for one, it's perhaps easier just to do that second method rather than create the whole table. There's one for you to have a practice on there as well, just so to make sure that you can understand. And then we're moving on to continuous functions. So these are non-continuous functions. These are just single points that are plotted, and there doesn't seem to appear to be any pattern for these ones at all. Whereas this looks more like our linear functions, our curved functions, our quadratic types of things, where we see it's some sort of a curve graph here. And when we're going to use our domain and range, we're going to be using those inequality symbols that we actually looked at in our last unit. So this one sets it up. Mathematicians use this type of shading to represent the domain of a function. To exactly measure the domain of a function, we include all of the x values that the graph crosses. So this actually uses that same idea that I was talking about a second ago. Basically, I'm looking, I want to read down to the graph. So my right hand side of the graph, I can see clearly is four. I don't know how accurate I can do this. Uh, the left side is clearly zero. So I'm making sure I kind of trap everything within these x values here. So I can see it's between one and four. Notice the open and closed circle. They're the things that we also used in that last section on inequalities. So the closed circle means I include the number, so I would include one. But the open circle means I do not include that number, so I would not include four. So as I go onto the next screen, actually it automatically does that for us. So you can see it does include the value one, but it does not include the value four. And notice I put X in the middle here. This is called a compound inequality. So what we're saying here is basically any values that we're allowed lie between this number on the left and this number on the right. And that's literally how we write our inequality. So they will always point to the left. The only thing that we're interested in is, is it equal to, or is it just strictly less than question here? So we'll never have anyone they go the opposite way around. We should always start with the number on the left first, and a number on the right second while we're doing this too. So we can do the same thing with this one. So this one here, the right hand side, I can see clearly is one as I read down to the axis. And for this one here, ooh, this looks like it's between negative one and negative two. So I'm gonna guess it's negative 1.5. I'm hoping they're not gonna do anything sneaky like that. And that certainly looks good. That certainly looks like it's lying on there as well. Now this time we have to think about the answer all of ourselves. So we have to do everything. So I'm gonna start on the left here, read up to the axis. I can see that that's negative five. And I can see it's the closed circle as well, which means I need equal to. So as I type this, as I click the equals, notice how it draws less than equal to as well. I'm gonna put my X there, because I'm talking about domain. Oh, and now it started to shade this in. I wasn't sure it was gonna do that. And then the last number here, eight, nine, 10. So we can see it's 10, but we cannot have 10 because it's an open circle at the end. And that would seem to meet that requirement pretty nicely. I notice the dotted line to show that not equal to, and also notice the solid line to show that something is equal to as well. And that's also something we talked about in that last unit. Uh, start on the left again. This looks like negative six and eight. So negative six, closed circle. So I'll include the equals and closed circle again. So I'll include another equal sign and that one should be good. 
Now we'll identify the range of functions. So this is also gonna use that same idea. This time I'm looking at the Y values. I'm trying to look for the highest value and the lowest value. Now, specifically for this one, there isn't actually a lowest value because although the graph ends here, remember this graph continues to go down, 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 down. It's just we're limited by the size of the piece of paper that we have or the size of the screen. So specifically for this one, we would just say, what's the highest point? And then say all the values below that. So we would say for this one, Y is less than or equal to one. I can see that I can have the value one because it's right here to one. So I know I can definitely have that value. So I do need the equal sign, and not strictly the less than for this one. And then I can do the same thing. I can look for what's my lowest point on this graph and what's my highest point on this graph. And then I can do the same thing. Let's go across. Um, oh, have that changed it? I thought it was going to type in the... Oh, it was just to just drag the points. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this one, I've got to correct it. So the lowest point here appears to be negative two. And the highest point appears to be positive two. So let me change that. Um, that's the lowest point here, which certainly should actually include an equal sign here. And so should this one as well. So actually, there's a slight mistake on that one. Uh, perhaps that's the part I'm supposed to correct as well. There we go. Now it's good. And for this one, so once they switch the words on us this time, so this time it's domain. So I'm looking for the X value. So the one on the left is at negative five and the one on the right is five. So I can already see it's these two numbers. So I can select that. But you can see that it's a solid circle. Uh, sorry, a closed circle, which means I need the equals. And on this side, it's also a closed circle. And it goes from one to three for some reason. I didn't notice that earlier. Uh, domain, same thing again. So I'm looking at X. So negative 10 is the furthest to the left. Three is the furthest to the right. So I can include that one. Uh, range this time. So the lowest point on the graph is this one here, negative six. And the highest point is one. Um, I got the, as there's no open circle, then I know I can just include this value. And the same for this one here as well. So I do need the one that says equal to uh, as well. And sometimes the graph continues in both directions. So this is going to continue to the left forever and ever. This is going to keep going up and up. And um, actually the same for the range as well. This is gonna, the Y value is just going to continue to get bigger and bigger. So for these ones, although the graphs continue forever and ever, we've got a couple of different ways. We can say all real numbers, which is actually my preferred way of doing this. And there is a symbol for all real numbers as well, which is actually a really quick way of writing this out. Uh, it's an R, but with two vertical lines. That actually means all real numbers. So that's a really quick way of doing that answer. Uh, you could say all real numbers, or you could say from negative infinity to positive infinity. We don't have the equal sign because infinity is not really a number. So we can't possibly have that number. We can get as close as possible to that. Um, this one here, let's have a look. Domain, well, I can see this continues to the left. It's certainly going up as well, but it's certainly continuing to the left and actually continues to the right as well. So that would be another one where we'd have that negative infinity, infinity or all real numbers. But for the range, I can certainly see that there's a lowest value. The lowest value is negative four. So you could say between negative four and then as it carries on, it goes all the way up to infinity. Or you could actually just say y is greater than or equal to negative four, which I think is probably a far more efficient way of doing that. Notice that this is actually that just written in reverse. Notice it points to the negative four, and this also points to the negative four. So that's probably a more efficient way of writing that. So here's ones for us to try, domain. So I'm looking where the x values are. Now notice this one continues forever and ever. So the smallest value is negative four, but then I can have anything after that. So x is greater than negative four. Open circle, so I can't have the equal sign. For the range, lowest value is one, and then it continues up forever and ever. So I would say for this one, y is greater than or equal to, oops. Positive one. And you can actually see the dots of one here as well. So you can definitely have equal to. Uh, domain continues in each direction. So that would be my all real numbers. And for the range, well, the lowest value is two, but so is the highest value. So it's just two. That's literally the only value you can actually have for that question. Uh, function or not. 
if a function for every input, there is exactly one output, which was kind of what was mentioned in the very first slide. Ashton claims that the relation shown is a function. Do you agree or do you disagree? So from X, it just goes to, there's just one value coming from one. From two, there's just one arrow. From three, there's just one arrow. And from four, there's just one arrow. Uh, so I claim that this is a function. So I would agree with Ashton for this one. And you could use those explanations we just talked about. Uh, Callie claims that the relation shown isn't a function, but Meg claims that it is. So all I do is I look at the X values and as soon as I see one repeat, I don't even need to look at the fact that there's multiple repeats, three and three, as soon as you see that repeat one, that means it's not a function. So therefore Cali would be correct for this one. Now, when we have a graph and we want to tell, what we use is something called the vertical line test. If you can draw a vertical line anywhere on the graph, if it goes through more than one point, then this is not a function. So you can see for this one here, if I draw a line here, there's two places and that's why this is not a function. And you could do the same on the ellipse here. So not a function. Now you've got to make sure the rule is anywhere on the graph because you could just draw a vertical line here and say, well, look, it only goes through one point. Or if you draw it here, whoops, not a very good vertical line. It only goes through one point. But if you actually draw it here, and I'll try and get it a little more vertical, then it actually goes through one, two, three places. So if it goes through more than one, so as in two or above, then it's not a function. And that's why this would not be a function. Whereas all of these would be examples of functions. No matter where you draw the line, it only goes through one place. Oops, not a very good straight line. Or not a very good vertical line, I should say. Uh, they're all going through just one place. One place, one place, one place. On the other one, what you're kind of looking for is you're looking for the curve to curve back on itself. So you can see that it's curving back, it's curving back on itself, it's curving back on itself. So also if you can see that C shape, that would curve back as well, or you see that S shape. And actually, if you just see a vertical line, um, I need to write CSI, I wasn't really planning what I was doing there. Um, the horizontal line was a function, um, but the vertical line is not a function. So that would certainly be one to keep an eye out for as well. Uh, now it's your turn. And this is probably where you can go ahead and you can go ahead and practice your assignment.